Good afternoon, everyone. It's 12 o'clock, so we're going to uh, get started. Uh, welcome to our cardio webinar, Integrating Behavioral Health and Primary Care Services, Lessons Learned from Three Ohio Practices. I'm Dr. Michael Constant from uh, Case Western Reserve University, and I'm pleased to serve as the principal investigator of the Ohio Cardiovascular and Diabetes uh, Health Collaborative, uh, also known as Cardio. Uh, Dr. Sherry Bolin is a co-PI of Cardio, uh, and she'll be helping to facilitate uh, today's uh, session. Uh, we were founded in uh, 2017 with a mission to uh, improve uh, cardiovascular and diabetes uh, health outcomes and to eliminate disparities in uh, Ohio's Medicaid population. And it brings together uh, Ohio's seven medical schools to identify, produce, and to disseminate uh, evidence-based cardiovascular and diabetes best practices uh, to primary care teams. And so to learn more about the collaborative uh, and to access our, our uh, online repository of best practices, you can see our website there, please uh, visit uh, cardio.org. Um, I would like to acknowledge and to thank our sponsor, the Ohio Department of Medicaid, and our administrative partner, the Ohio College's uh, Medicine's Government Resource Center, and also to recognize the incredible partnership of Ohio's seven medical schools who contribute uh, to make cardio the success of this collaborative. Um, so I'm now going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Bolin, who's going to help facilitate uh, today's sessions. Great. Thanks, Dr. Constan. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to run through some brief logistics. Um, if you're joining as a group with more than one person at a computer, we're going to ask that you please use the chat feature now to just um, chat in your names and emails of all the attendees in a group. Just so afterward, if we're going to send out um, any information, we have um, surveys and CME, so we can send that to the right people. Also, we're going to be using the Q&A feature um, to submit questions. You can submit them at any point during the webinar. Questions will be answered during the Q&A portion of the program. So if you're able to, when you write the question, if you know what speaker you'd like to address it, that would help us, although um, not necessary, but it will help us as we get to the end. And lastly, we will be having a post-webinar evaluation survey, and we'll send that link that will be shared at the end of today's webinar and sent by email um, that we'd like to have completed by February 17th. And that's to get uh, improvements that we can do for next time and hear what you liked and also learn what topics you might want to hear for uh, subsequent educational features that we do. Uh, just to let you know, we do have CME affiliated with this webinar, and so we will send you an email um, if you want to do that, you just fill out the survey. Um, it's due by March 10th. And if you have any problems or questions, you'll contact Kathy Sullivan. And also want to let everyone know that there's no conflicts of interest for any of our speakers, moderators, or planners for this activity today. And just an overview of our session today, we'll have Dr. Wharton speaking about Ohio's Medicaid Managed Care Program and the Next Generation and how that relates with integrated behavioral health. We'll have Dr. Dolber talking about an overview of integrated behavioral health, and then we'll hear how three clinics are doing this um, in different areas of the state, from University of Cincinnati, the Ohio State University, and Neomed. And then we'll have a facilitated uh, question and answer at the end. And these are our speakers today. Uh, we're excited to have them, and we'll be introducing them as we go through the webinar today. And with that, I will introduce Dr. Wharton. Uh, he has joined the Ohio Department of Medicaid almost four years ago, where he is now focusing on pharmacy redesign, opioids, dental, comprehensive primary care, and behavioral health integration. Uh, previously, Dr. Wharton served as VP and Ohio Medical Director for CareSource, a large Medicaid managed care plan, and he enjoyed a 20-year career as a family physician and hospitalist in a rural community and served on the board of directors and as quality committee chair for a 120 physician primary care network. So uh, welcome, Dr. Wharton, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Sherry, and um, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for taking a few minutes to uh, listen to um, a few things that Medicaid is up to. Uh, those of you who have been pretty involved with Medicaid know that we're in a time of incredible change. Uh, we've got some really exciting new things that we're working on. Uh, some of those things have been accelerated by uh, our, our COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, and uh, nonetheless, we, we trudge on ahead and we are uh, doing quite well. Next slide, please. 
So just to let you know that we started um, this administration uh, and our present director really wanting to do better for the people we serve. Our director is passionate uh, about our members. She's passionate about Medicaid in general, the vulnerability of our members and how we can uh, take what we learn and spread that through the state of Ohio uh, in a much more standard way. Uh, she also thought it was very important that we focus on the individual uh, as opposed to the business uh, of Medicaid. So we started this journey, uh, and this journey started with a couple of RFIs, uh, requests for information. We really wanted to learn from providers, members, other stakeholders, and advocates what Medicaid was doing well and what Medicaid needed improvement on. And we uh, actually identified quite a few themes. Uh, we'd had uh, countless provider uh, and member in-person listening sessions where we would actually just listen uh, and write down uh, ideas and thoughts about how Medicaid could improve. Uh, certainly one of the things that I've always been passionate about as a family doc is uh, the impression that uh, primary care physicians throughout Ohio have of Medicaid. Uh, and, and I realize it's not always the best because frankly, mine wasn't always the best. We took this very seriously and we learned a lot. We uh, uncovered problems with our uh, pharmacy benefit managers. We uncovered huge administrative burdens that we really didn't know we had even existed. Uh, we had uh, gaps in data. Uh, we had inconsistent data. Uh, we had uh, inconsistent member care. Uh, across the state uh, and across the managed care plans. And so uh, through identifying those things, next slide please, we kind of made a before and after managed care program vision. What we decided, and, and actually the, our director has called this Medicaid reimagined. Uh, and, and what we have basically done is literally uh, taken the business out of the center. This is no longer a managed care business model. Uh, it is a person-centered model. Uh, and in order to achieve that, we have uh, initiated a series of procurements, uh, including a single pharmacy benefit manager, so that uh, no matter what the managed care plan uh, is, there will be one pharmacy benefit manager uh, for uh, pharmacists and physicians to deal with. Ohio RISE procurement, which is uh, behavioral health uh, in high-risk children, uh, and that will actually be a managed care organization in and of itself that will coordinate with other managed care organizations specifically for those high-risk children. A fiscal intermediary, the fiscal intermediary, intermediary uh, is a way to, uh, for providers to send claims to a single place. Uh, we have uh, just finished that procurement. Uh, that will be DXC Gainwell. Uh, and so essentially that organization then uh, will coordinate with the managed care plans uh, regarding all claims. We've centralized credentialing. So instead of credentialing with Medicaid and then going out and having to credential with each of the five managed care plans, uh, we will have one credentialing process in the future that will be uh, owned by Medicaid uh, and a vendor that we're working with. Uh, and then finally, the managed care procurement itself, which we should be hearing about soon. Uh, that is uh, the uh, major managed care organizations across the state uh, have, have reapplied and applied for uh, uh, their job. Uh, and so uh, we are anticipating in the next few weeks, hopefully uh, uh, releasing these uh, new uh, plans that have been chosen. Uh, so lots of exciting things uh, going on. Uh, and certainly our goals uh, have been made pretty clear, certainly improving the wellness and health outcomes uh, of our members, uh, emphasizing this personal care experience, uh, personalized care experience. Um, this, this all kind of points back to the triple aim, supporting providers, actually call it the quadruple aim with providers uh, in patient, better patient care. Uh, having everybody rowing in the same direction, uh, as opposed to a lot of various things going on, uh, really trying to coordinate things a whole lot better. Improving care for children and adults with complex needs, uh, critically important behavioral health playing a huge role in this. Uh, uh, our CPC program uh, for a long time now has uh, valued uh, the process of integrated care uh, and finding ways to actually measure the degree of inter integration uh, specifically for behavioral health uh, in the past. 
Uh, MedTap has also recently uh, finished uh, another grant uh, with Cincinnati Children's uh, integrating behavioral health um, uh, providers with uh, pediatric residents uh, targeting children from zero to five years old. Uh, basically, uh, every well child chip is uh, accompanied by a behavioral health professional uh, visit. Uh, and uh, so that has been about a two, two and a half year project that recently wrapped up and actually should be getting some published results out soon on that. Um, increasing program transparency and accountability. Uh, you know, a lot of that uh, just comes from the uh, data uh, issues that we've had. Uh, some bad press that we've gotten, frankly, especially in the pharmacy world. Uh, and uh, one of our goals is to make sure that in the future, uh, both taxpayers and other stakeholders have a really good idea uh, of uh, what we're doing, what we're paying for, and what we're not. So this is the timeline of our uh, procurements. Uh, we do have uh, um, several uh, in play, uh, and uh, we are hoping that by January of 2021, uh, people will realize a completely new Medicaid program uh, from what they're used to. Uh, if you're not involved with Medicaid, we hope you will be in the future. We do hope to do uh, much better. We want uh, uh, to be good partners with our providers. We want to take this uh, beyond the academic world and also getting into, uh, you know, making this a reasonable partnership with all primary care providers across Ohio. In the chat, uh, I did also, I was asked to talk a little bit about behavioral health codes, and I will say that those codes uh, are changing always. We are always evaluating new codes. We are looking for evidence uh, to uh, expand uh, what we cover and what we don't, and certainly that's true in the behavioral health world. Uh, in the chat box, uh, I did include a um, a link uh, to uh, bh.medicaid.ohio.gov backslash manuals. Uh, this is a 97 page behavioral health provider manual uh, that does uh, go into some detail around the codes that are presently being paid for. Uh, that manual was last updated in January uh, and it is a work in progress. Uh, and so keep your eye on that as time goes on uh, as we do hope to see more changes. In the meantime, I'm looking forward to learning a lot more about behavior health integration. Uh, as I said, we're always looking for evidence-based reasons uh, to uh, change what we do and do what we do better. Uh, and with that, I will pass it on to Dr. Dolber. All right. Thanks a lot, Dr. Wharton. Uh, always exciting to hear about um, people paying more attention to behavioral health, and I hope I can give you some of that evidence. So I am a duly trained uh, psychiatrist and internist up at University Hospitals. Uh, involved quite a bit within our system in behavioral health integration. Starting with the problem, we need to understand the problem. There's an unmet mental health need and it impacts physical health in some way. We'll get into that. Uh, what's the solution to the problem? We'll go through the proposed solutions and what the evidence is for how they can be effective. And then finally, and this will be mostly the panelists discussing this with you, we'll get some ideas on how to actually practically implement those solutions uh, in a variety of practices. Let's uh, start with the problem. This is some epidemiology here. So if you measure by disability adjusted life years, you'll see that mental health and substance use disorders actually have a greater burden in this country uh, than really any other uh, type of chronic illness. Despite that, of people who have a diagnosed mental illness, one out of five of them are not receiving care for that. And that's of people with a diagnosis. And we'll talk more about that. And then you'll see that the attention that we're paying to this uh, financially is maybe not quite uh, what it deserves uh, based on the burden there. I said that people without a diagnosis weren't even included in the previous part, and, and this is why that's important. Uh, the delay between the onset of mental illness symptoms and treatment is about 11 years on average. So if you ask people, when did your symptoms actually start before you got treated? It's on average 11 years. So a long time these people are going, without having a diagnosis. People with, diet, with depression in particular have a 40% higher risk of developing cardiometabolic diseases. If you look at emergency department use, one out of eight of those ED visits is associated with mental illness or substance use. In general, serious mental illness costs about $200 billion in lost earnings every year. And if you look at just cost to the healthcare system, 
people with a mental health or substance use disorder end up costing two to three times more. And it's not because of treatment of their mental illness or their addiction, it's because of their increased use of acute care and inpatient. Let's talk a little bit about how mental and physical health uh, are related. And this is taking it back to around 1990. Uh, this is where people started looking at this and figuring out what to do about it, which is why we're going back so far. But this is a family medicine practice, actually. They looked at the chief complaints of the patients coming in, and they said, how often are we identifying, uh, quote, organic cause uh, of their chief complaint? And as you can see in the graph there, for a variety of common primary care complaints, rarely did they come up with a, a solid organic diagnosis. Um, and why is that? Uh, well, obviously, you know, we're biased right now to be thinking of behavioral health as is something that's involved with that. So uh, if you look at the table there on the right, I'll direct you to the far left and the far right-hand columns of that table. Uh, they looked at the number of symptoms and the prevalence of either an anxiety or a mood disorder. And you can see there clearly, uh, if you follow down the left and right side, that as the number of physical symptoms increases, the likelihood of a comorbid uh, anxiety or mood disorder increases. Now that doesn't mean that th these are just somatic symptoms, that this is caused by their mood or anxiety disorder, more likely there's a cycle, a positive feedback loop of mood disorder, anxiety disorder, and uh, physical symptoms feeding into each other and propagating. But there is clearly a strong relation there. So you would ask yourself if they're so tightly associated and both in how, uh, how they function together and in how they affect the healthcare system, why should we be treating them separately? This is a way to conceptualize the levels of care integration. And I'll just orient you to the top of this table. We start off with coordinated care where it's distant, but there's some coordination between physical and behavioral health. Um, we move into putting these people together at the same location. Now, at least we have co-location. And then finally, uh, on, the, on the right there, and this is our goal, we get to actual integrated care where systems are integrated. So I'll, I'll walk you through this step by step. So starting with level one, this is where we maybe are now in some places, hopefully um, progressing past that, but you have your mental health care and your medical physical health care at two distinct locations. There's very little uh, collaboration between them. They have separate systems. There are a lot of barriers to sharing anything. Moving on to level two, now uh, you're still at a distance. Uh, we're still not co-located, but maybe there is some attempt at coordination. Um, there's some phone calls between providers and they're starting to collaborate a little bit. Moving into co-location, uh, clear benefits to being co-located. Uh, even if you're just at that early level of not systematically changing things, providers can see each other more easily. It's more convenient for patients. There's less of a stigma for patients to go from one office to another, then driving to another physical location uh, that's purely focused on behavioral health. Moving on to level four, now we have uh, on-site and we're starting to integrate some systems. So maybe you've got some shared EMR, uh, maybe you're part of the same uh, check-in process, uh, you've got some of the same staff on both sides. It makes collaboration uh, a bit easier. And then finally, moving into level five, when you're at level five, that essentially means you've got level six in your sites and you're working on getting there. Level six would be the full integration uh, systematically with a, a really thoughtful approach uh, on how we put everything together to really be unified and, and not just be two kind of separate entities that are uh, trying to work together. So what level six really is uh, and the way it's been implemented currently with the strongest evidence is called collaborative care. So on the next slide here, I'm gonna show you the general model of how collaborative care works with the roles. So over there on the left, you see you've got the primary care provider, the patient. Uh, you may have some other behavioral health clinicians who uh, are involved either on site or not, uh, and then other resources, which the primary care is generally navigating. Now, what we've added here with collaborative care is on site uh, in the primary care clinic, there's a behavioral health care manager. So behavioral health manager. Uh, this is someone who is, you know, maybe case manager, social worker level training, has some therapy experience, uh, has some experience working with mental illnesses. They are getting referrals from the PCP. They're engaging directly with a the patient on site. Uh, 
Uh, they're able to provide close follow-up with the patient. They're able to make referrals uh, with a lot more specificity uh, and awareness to other external resources. In addition, they are going to be communicating on a regular basis with a consulting psychiatrist who may or may not be on site. Uh, they can be by telehealth, it can be by anything, as long as they have a chance to meet with the consulting psychiatrist regularly to run through their patient panel uh, and essentially get advice and recommendations. The consulting psychiatrist then not only advises the BHM, but can provide recommendations uh, directly to the PCP. And uh, if needed, if it's a complicated case or they need to see more, they can arrange a, a chance to meet with a patient uh, directly, usually on a very short-term basis uh, to help elucidate um, what they learned from the BHM. Now, before I tell you more about how the collaborative care model works, I wanna convince you why this is the model that we're looking at right now. This has been studied pretty intensely. Uh, collaborative care, the idea came out of University of Washington in the Pacific Northwest. They had this need because uh, I don't know how familiar um, you may be with the area, but they cover a tri-state area. They have a large rural area that has no access to, or very limited access to healthcare. Um, so they had to come up with unique models for how to provide mental health care in those uh, situations. Since they developed the collaborative care model, there have been over 80 RCTs, uh, which have demonstrated effectiveness over care as usual. I'll just mention briefly, in 2006, there was a meta-analysis that confirmed that. Um, even a Cochrane review, which I think says a lot of a Cochrane review supports something uh, back in 2012, there have been benefits not just for behavioral health, not just for depression, but other types of behavioral health problems, as well as physical health outcomes. And most relevant to us here is uh, improvements in hypertension, diabetes, uh, and tobacco use. Um, the last bullet point there, team care, that was actually uh, something building on the collaborative care model, where in addition to the behavioral health manager, they added a nurse care manager who's like the medical counterpart to the BHM, who was responsible for tracking A1C, blood pressure, cholesterol, and intervening on those. And using that approach, they saved, based on how conservative their predictive estimate was, uh, at, at least $600 uh, per patient. Um, so a pretty significant improvement uh, financially there as, a, as an indicator of how, how much they were able to improve people's health uh, with those additional roles. So um, this all started uh, with the IMPACT trial, uh, was the first big trial to uh, assess the efficacy of collaborative care um, up in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, roughly 2,000 depressed, mostly older adults over 18 uh, uh, primary care clinics with all different types of uh, settings. Uh, and on the next slide, you'll see that the outcomes, in this case, they were specifically looking at depression um, and using 50% or greater improvement in depression on the PHQ-9 as their marker uh, of success. And you can see that even on multiple different uh, primary care clinics, they had pretty consistent and very significant uh, improvement in depression. So now that I've maybe convinced you a little bit about the evidence, we'll talk more about the framework, um, the skeleton of how collaborative care works beyond just the roles. We have basic principles underlying collaborative care, and then we have the key elements of how it's, uh, of how it's applied. Uh, and I find it's useful to think of these together. So the first principle is population-based care. We're not just going to be looking at an individual patient. We're going to be doing population level interventions across the entire clinic. And the way we do that is with the universal screening. We'll, we'll talk more about why it's a universal screening. That's currently the recommendation. Um, the next principle, measurement-based treatment to target and accountable care. Uh, the way we meet those is with the registry. So we have a registry that can be something as simple as a protected Excel file or something as advanced as uh, something automated that you do within your EMR, where we can track changes and things like the PHQ-9, the GAD-7 over time uh, and look and see which patients are improving, how much, uh, understand how it's impacting your practice, understand uh, which patients maybe aren't benefiting and, and need more attention. Um, Patient-centered collabor collaboration, which is really consistent uh, with what Dr. Wharton was mentioning um, in the new kind of reframe of uh, the managed care model um, and that the elements associated with that, we're minimizing specialty referrals. Um, so it's a tighter care team, education for the patient and the rest of the care team on behavioral uh, components 
Um, we're sharing documentation, communicating, and we have uh, access to case management uh, for other identified patient needs, maybe social needs uh, as well. And finally, the last principle is evidence-based care. By doing this, by having a BHM, part of a collaborative care team and a consulting psychiatrist, you help to ensure that they're getting evidence-based behavioral health treatment. How do you practically implement this? On the next slide, I'll tell you a little bit about that. If someone doesn't necessarily screen positive, but the PCP or anyone else on the, really on the medical side uh, has questions and they need to clarify the patient's diagnosis, if the patient is treatment resistant, if there are patients, and I shouldn't really say difficult patients here, but if there are patients who the team is having a hard time engaging with for whatever reason for behavioral concerns, they, that could be a referral uh, for assistance uh, engaging uh, around those behaviors. Screening, currently the USPSTF recommends depression screening for everyone as long as you have access to resources, um, which is why it's currently universal screening. Uh, and then just to give you a sense of how long this takes per patient, we like to see for the PHQ-9 as an example, get their score under 10 or a 50% decrease in depression symptoms. Usually that happens in the first three to six months of collaborative care. After that, you move into a monitoring phase where they're not seen as frequently. Uh, and the total time to completion of that phase is about six to 10 months. Uh, and usually over the course of that, they'll have at least one medication change. Finally, I wanna to talk to you about billing uh, and how this is practically implemented. Uh, the billing is done based on time. It's not based on the psychiatrist, it's based on the behavioral health manager who's co-located in the clinic. Uh, they add up all the time they spend whether it's directly with the patient, discussing with the PCP, discussing with the psychiatrist and anyone else, uh, and then the billing goes through the PCP practice. So for more discussion on practical implementation, I wanna hand you over to our panelists. Uh, we'll start with Dr. Rugg and her team at uh, University of Cincinnati. I am also like Dr. Dolber, a combined family, actually family medicine and psychiatry trained physician. I'm the Director of Integrated Mental Health Services here at the University of Cincinnati. And for the Q&A session, I'll be joined by two of my colleagues, Dr. Lauren Wong, who's a primary care physician in our system, specializing in care of um, adult patients with intellectual and developmental disabilities, and Corey Keaton, who is a family medicine and psychiatry psychiatrist who's embedded in Dr. Wong's practice as the collaborating psychiatrist. So uh, a little bit about our mental health integration at the University of Cincinnati. So to uh, just refer back to the previous presentation that you just heard, we have uh, collaborations and integration that really span the spectrum of levels of integration that you, that you heard Dr. Dolber share. We are, however, especially in our primary care network and then a number of subspecialty groups really pushing towards that level five and ultimately level six level of integration using the collaborative care model that Dr. Dolber just shared with you. So this slide uh, is my summary of the AIM Center out of Washington State's collaborative care model. Um, the image that you see here is from the AIM Center, and it's just another way to capture what I think are the pertinent components of this particular model. First of all, that the patient is at the very center of the work and that their primary points of contact are with the embedded behavioral care manager and the primary care provider and that uh, using a registry-based approach, which is the population-based approach, capturing a population of people, screening people, and entering them into a registry, a panel of patients are managed by this team with the psychiatry consultant providing support to the behavioral care manager, and then communicating with the primary medical provider um, about the patient's care. So again, using a measurement-based approach, um, grounded in a stepped uh, evidence-based um, interventions really kind of starts to drive towards that accountable care. So I'm going to get into the weeds in the next slide a little bit to give you a flavor of what that process actually looks like. In our primary care network, we have a behavioral care manager. She is a licensed independent social worker by training. She's embedded in, one, in a number of our primary care sites as behavioral care manager. We have identified patients with hypertension and diabetes as our target population for 
universal screening. And so those patients are regular screened with the PHQ-9 and the GAD-7. Patients that screen positive, sort of like what you heard earlier, get referred to our behavioral care manager who then meets with the patient and recently it's been over telehealth, does an assessment and together with the patient drafts a treatment plan that includes starting usually brief psychotherapy interventions and then places that patient on our registry that is then reviewed with the consulting psychiatrist. The consulting psychiatrist meets with the behavioral care manager on a weekly basis and reviews the panel of patients that the behavioral care manager is treating. They also then may make treatment recommendations to the primary care physician, usually around um, psychopharmacology um, escalation of care, and they usually are communicating using our electronic medical record. Sometimes they'll identify a patient that maybe hasn't responded the way we would anticipate or needs uh, additional diagnostic clarity, and then that patient will be scheduled for a face-to-face with a psychiatrist. So just to kind of highlight what the patient experience is, I wanted to share with you the story of one of our patients that actually went through this process in the fall. So we had a 67-year-old woman with type 2 diabetes, hypertension, and a prior diagnosis of major depressive disorder. On her index visit, uh, which was her routine diabetes visit, she was found to have an A1C of 13.3%. And so she was screened with the PHQ-9 and GAD-7, and you can see that she screened positive, so her scores were above 10 for both of those. The behavioral care manager met with her and started um, a treatment plan that included problem-solving therapy, focusing on barriers to her diabetes control. She was bringing in some cognitive behavioral therapy skills and motivational interviewing skills to identify areas of stress that were contributing to the depression and anxiety and really working on um, goal setting around behavior changes, specifically targeting the the diabetes side of things, as well as thinking about adherence to medication regimens for the depression. At her three month visit, three month post that index visit, her A1C had dropped to 7.4, her PHQ-9 was now four and her GAD-7 had decreased to zero. Again, this would qualify um, her to be in full remission for the mental health disorders. Just as a side note and to kind of highlight the benefit of having this embedded behavioral care manager as really part of the full primary care team, because the behavioral care manager had frequent contact with the patient, she actually identified um, an acute gastrointestinal illness that had developed and that the patient happened to talk to her about and was able to, the BHC was able to facilitate getting the patient quickly connected to her primary care provider and then eventually ended up needing kind of a higher level of care to manage that illness. But it was because of the relationship uh, that the patient had with the behavioral care manager and the frequency of visits and the team-based approach that um, the patient had uh, rapid access to the care that she needed. There are, of course, um, a lot of lessons that we've learned in this process and um, facing some of the challenges uh, and opportunities. And so in the next slide, I just briefly touch on those. So we've learned that we need to get buy-in from our institution to really help target the care, to get the care managers on board. We're still exploring sustainability for the financial models to support this, not all of the payers Um, actually cover the codes, and then we're expanding into subspecialty populations. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues in uh, from Ohio State. Um, I'll just introduce myself briefly. I'm Mark Rastetter. I'm a family doc in the Department of Family and Community Medicine and the Vice Chair for Community Health in our department. Um, I'll be talking a little bit. I, I want to turn it over and introduce my colleague, Dr. Lori Greco, who will introduce herself and start our presentation. I'm Dr. Lori Greco, and I am the Vice Chair for Behavioral Health and Assistant Professor in uh, Family and Community Medicine. I'm also the Director for our Clinical Health and Primary Care Psychology Training Programs. And so in our clinics, we provide a full range of behavioral health services, which includes outpatient behavioral health and primary care behavioral health integrated model of care and also interdisciplinary services in some of our new uh, family and community medicine specialty care clinics. And I'm gonna focus on the bottom two today because these are the truly integrated models that we implement. 
And so uh, you've heard about the collaborative care model today. Uh, we actually use a different model of integration called the primary care behavioral health, uh, PCBH model of service delivery. And I just wanna say at the outset that I do not view these models as in any way contradictory. In fact, my, my recommendation and what I think best serves the population it would be blended models where uh, we provide the full range of services and care. So that's actually what I'd love to see happen in our uh, department. Next. And so key components of PCBH, and you can just go ahead and, and click three times, um, it is level six, if you do it well, uh, level six integration where you provide truly team-based primary care. You have uh, typically psychologists and social workers integrated in the primary care clinic, uh, working side by side, uh, the other members of the care team. The behavioral health, in, in addition to being fully integrated, offers brief visits at the time of the medical appointment. And in the PCBH model, what we do, our role and our targets very much mirror that of the primary care physician. And so we view ourselves really as generalists and we will see all comers, any age and any behaviorally influenced condition, which if we think about what's a behaviorally influenced condition, it's like everything, you know? And so uh, we really work with um, the PCPs to identify high priority cases who would really benefit from having additional behavioral health support. Um, and those patients may or may not have a mental health diagnosis. Sometimes it really is more of a health promotion visit or disease prevention visit or uh, helping to co-manage uh, chronic health conditions. Um, key to these services, our visits are brief because they're conducted in the context of the primary care visit and uh, critically important using evidence-based interventions so that what we are doing is uh, high impact. Um, in that short amount of time. And the goal really is to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of the primary care visits. Um, and so how we've been implementing it thus far is really within the context of two of our training clinics. Um, and so I've been doing this and I've been supervising advanced level trainees. So psychology fellows and master's level doctoral students. And again, they are embedded or I am embedded in the primary care clinic. My goal, and, and as I am a newly appointed vice chair for the department, uh, my two-year plan is, is to do this on a broader scale, is to start to roll this out to our different clinics because of how uh, truly impactful it is when you do this well. And so when we're doing the PCA, PCBH model, what implementation looks like on the ground is the behavioral health clinician, whether it's a psychologist, social worker, or both, is part of the primary care team. That's a standard routine part of care. Uh, we provide what's called curbside consultation and a lot of team education. And so when I have fellows in clinic or when I'm in clinic, we regularly present uh, clinical nuggets to our family medicine residents and faculty preceptors. Uh, we do warm handoffs and same day visits, again, uh, all comers. And uh, we do spend the first part of our day, I would say, of helping to scrub the, the charts for the PCPs and helping to flag on the front end who we think would help, who would benefit from a behavioral health visit. Um, and then we provide as needed and same day joint visits. And my personal favorite is tag team visits. And that might be when the behavioral health clinician maybe starts a visit for the PCP, uh, joins in the middle, takes it over, or even finishes the visit for the PCP. Uh, thus again, helping to create more efficient care in the primary care clinic. Uh, we also do care coordination and assist with resource connection and referrals as needed. And uh, another thing, I love program development. And so something that I do a lot of and also have my trainees do is develop what are called clinical pathway programs. And this again is to help act, uh, improve access and to augment care. And with our clinical pathway programs, um, it really is looking at what are the population needs and developing a pathway uh, to enhanced care. And we've been doing this through education and self-management groups. And I've listed groups that we've run over the past uh, three to four years. 
And it really maps on to my trainee's interests. Um, and that's where you'll see like a one-year diabetes education and self-management group. The next year is insomnia, health and wellness. The one that's been our standing program is chronic pain because that's, that's one of my deep interests. Um, I love our new interdisciplinary clinics we've been um, implementing in our family medicine department. And so two that I have helped to co-found interdisciplinary clinics for our refugee health clinic and our primary care pain clinic. And you'll see what we do, but let me just quickly turn it over to Mark so that Dr. Rackstetter can provide a quick case example. This is the case of Pima, a 65 year old who, who presented into our, uh, in, into our refugee clinic. You know, we were identifying through the through co-located and integrated behavioral health, uh, you know, some of the medical concerns, which were type two diabetes and hypertension um, and, and chronic pain. And then, you know, by, by having an integrated model, we're able to dive deeper into identification of depression, anxiety, and a, and a history of trauma, and then go through a values assessment. Uh, what this uh, involved in and from, and from her values, really looking at more involvement of family and care and how we could do that more intentionally um, and the other things listed. What it resulted in was 10 integrated visits. So when the, when we were, the patient was having medical visits, there was the behavioral health interventionist was there as well. Uh, one of our psychologists. And so uh, we're able to sit and talk about adherence and activities and mood and, and look uh, at one of the biggest risk factors for cardiovascular health was tobacco. And as I said, replace it with yak cheese. Uh, the patient actually um, was chewing on yak cheese and then would spit it out. And that was her replacement for, uh, for, for tobacco. We were initially concerned she was eating more cheese. So it was not improving cardiovascular health, but it was just chewing it and, and spitting it out. So working on her own plan to, to decrease her tobacco use. And I'll, I'll just turn it back briefly to Dr. Greco, uh, and then we'll turn it on to our, our colleagues. The thing I'm really excited about in terms of opportunity is workforce development uh, and really starting to, to get people prepared to roll this out on a broader level. Thank you. And now we'll turn over to our uh, colleagues over at Neomed with uh, Dr. Vaughn. Good afternoon. So I'm going to go rather quick so that we have time to get to the question and answer. As Dr. Greco said, my name is Dr. Alicia Bond, and I will be presenting the model that we've implemented at our student-run free clinic at Northeast Ohio Medical University, or Neomed. So a quick background about our clinic. So we're a primarily student-run free clinic. Um, we operate as an all-encompassing primary care clinic, which includes chronic disease management, health maintenance, and behavioral health services. These are primarily for the underinsured and underserved. The medical and student involvement, we have upper levels that are clinical managers throughout the week. And currently we have clinic every Saturday where we have all levels of medical and pharmacy students that actually guide the visit and are directly involved with patient interview and plan. So for integration of our behavioral health at our clinic, uh, in 2019, the clinic received a grant from Health Resource and Services Administration, or HRSA, to allow us to expand our services and hire a part-time behavioral health coordinator. In January of 2020, she joined the team and started coming to our in-person clinics. Um, the students would perform PHQ-2s on all patients. So if the PHQ-2 was positive or if it was a new patient, we went on to do a PHQ-9 as well. We used the targeted score of 15 to account for an automatic consultation with the behavioral health coordinator. Behavioral health coordinator could also be included in the visit per the attending discretion at that time um, based on other concerns that were being addressed that day. So as we were adopting and implementing this, of course, as everybody knows, COVID-19 happened. So in March of 2020, our clinic not only had to transition to virtual visits, but also transition from paper charts to an electronic health record. Um, what we ended up doing was a model that we use Zoom as we're using today with one main Zoom call. Using Zoom's functionality to have breakout rooms, we had different rooms serving as teams that were seeing different patients. This allowed us to facilitate that our behavioral health coordinator was still with us on site because she was just placed into breakout rooms as deemed necessary to assist in the care. Starting in August of 2020, we switched over to a hybrid clinic model with patients being seen in person and via telehealth. Again, we kept the primary hub in Zoom because we couldn't bring all of our volunteers to the in-person site and still maintain social distance. So our team leader would actually take a laptop in, set it on the counter in the room. That way the rest of the team could still be a part of the visit and the behavioral health coordinator is, that's how she would also um, be involved in the patient care. 
This is just a picture of our clinic. Um, we were used to have about 50 students in the clinic on any given Saturday, and I think we're down to about seven plus the attending. So obstacles. So for us, one of the big things was the electronic health record implementation. So there was no standard template. There was no standard behavioral health note. Um, and so students found, as well as all the other things that came with develop or implementing an EHR, that this made it very cumbersome and time consuming. Our visits at the clinic were already about 90 minutes on average per patient. So I know it doesn't model everybody's community practice. Um, what we found then was students were not doing the behavioral health screenings and at times just not bringing the behavioral health coordinator into the visit. Um, at times she was asked to contact them um, separate from the visit, kind of going back to more the level one to three of care. The virtual environment itself, we're all aware of the obstacles. And then junior medical students lacking comfort and familiarity, especially when it came to things like in the PHQ-9, you know, asking questions about suicidality. So to address our obstacles, so in April of 2020, the clinic actually hosted an elective for displaced fourth year medical students um, that couldn't return to their clinicals uh, due to COVID, where they developed behavioral health training modules to help address some of the junior students' comfort and ability to complete the necessary screenings. We also had our behavioral health coordinator begin to do in-depth chart reviews. That way she could insert herself into the room and into the visit rather than waiting to be asked by the student or the attending. And just continuing the formalization of the process of a visit, including you know, making sure that the PHQ-2 and 9, if appropriate, got done at each visit, and encouragement that consistently needs provided to the students. So for our compelling patient case, we had an adolescent patient that, um, this was while we were still completely virtual, presented via phone with mom. They were reporting self-injurious behavior. So the way our clinic works, student called, took the history, and actually they hang up. The behavioral health coordinator the and the attending and student were all put into that breakout room, were able to speak, come up with a treatment plan. Um, and then the outcome was we were able to call the patient back. All of us stayed in the room and, and were on speakerphone. We were able to contract the patient for safety, provide resources, including um, access to the suicide hotline or the number rather. And the patient was also referred to local community mental health agency where the patient has since established care and is doing well. So this is just an example of um, how we've integrated. So thank you for your attention. At this time, I will turn over to Dr. Elise Karen for the question and answer part. Thank you. Uh, my name is Elise Karen. I'm an associate professor of medicine at Case Western Reserve University. Um, and I'm gonna moderate the Q&A session. The first question's from Dr. Burko, and I think it's directed to Dr. Wharton. Are health and behavioral codes going to be considered? Absolutely. I uh, have been in the past and have unfortunately been um, <clears throat> lost because of budgetary concerns, but yeah, absolutely. They are on the uh, agenda. Dr. Schonk presented a question. He said to all panelists, impressive models in our CPC plus work, we have learned that many of our initiatives require a different approach in smaller practices. Has anyone explored how this can be translated to smaller primary care practices that do not have the resources? Many small town and rural practices report having difficulty finding behavioral health clinicians. It would seem that the virtual connections might be an opportunity. I don't have a great uh, deal of experience with that. I would think telehealth would be uh, a good opportunity. Um, so, you know, it, it, there's really no reason you couldn't have a dedicated behavioral health manager who has uh, like a telehealth room in your clinic and patients could go in there and be set up with a telehealth feed directly to the BHM. Um, that model could still end up being more efficient and allow you to treat more patients than having a psychiatrist directly uh, seeing all the patients. Um, uh, you would just have to work out the telehealth component, have a stable connection uh, and uh, you, you know coordinate with a behavioral health manager who is distant somewhere. Any thoughts from any of the other panelists? Just to add that um, the AIM Center, which we've kind of, some of us have referenced out of Washington state does have experience with, with primary care practices in rural um, communities with some of these models because that's who their population has been. So there, there are some examples of using um, telehealth especially to help provide these services to rural practices. 
Next question comes from Dr. Rajesh, and I think it's directed to the University of Cincinnati. Are medication changes communicated to the patient by the behavioral health case manager or the PCP? Ideally by the PCP because the primary care provider is actually the one still writing the prescriptions and um, really managing the medication. Sometimes if the behavioral care manager has been in discussion with the patient already about side effects and things like that, um, they may be involved in the conversation, but it really needs to come from the primary care provider, ideally. Thank you, Dr. Rugg. Um, the next question, once again, directed toward to Cincinnati is from Dr. Tang. How do you integrate PhD psychologists into this model? We actually tried um, with our sickle cell population and we found that, um, th that we couldn't figure out how to make the financial model work for that model. I think that the psychologists are probably better suited for the model that you heard from Ohio State actually, um, but I'd be interested to see what they say. Any comments from Ohio State? So we, we definitely, um, use uh, PhD level trainees and myself doing integrated care. And um, for our interdisciplinary pain clinic and our interdisciplinary refugee health clinic, we are billing for all of those visits. And, and I think it's been overall just uh, really, really wonderful to have that uh, psychology presence. And I'll add that even in collaborative care, in my own collaborative care practice, we refer uh, to psychologists, not infrequently, if it's someone who has needs like a patient with PTSD or anyone who I think would really benefit from CBT or evidence-based psychotherapies that we're not able to provide through our BHM, uh, we'll refer them to a psychologist. Uh, and they can actually see the psychologist for that specific targeted therapy and continue to get other kind of general support from the BHM at the same time. Yeah, and I'll just I'll just add too from the, the psychologist perspective. But then we've also uh, you know been able to leverage the expertise of our licensed uh, social workers as well, and, and so have a real collaborative model there of, of which our uh, social work uh, colleagues are able to do a lot of the intervention, especially in the primary care model. So um, it, it's it's been a nice opportunity to work uh, collaboratively across disciplines. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for our Q&A. If there are questions that you would like to have answered, uh, you can email Cardio and we will get back to you with some responses. Uh, I think somebody will type the appropriate email address into the chat so you have that. And I apologize for not being able to get to all of your questions. I'll turn it over to Dr. Bolin now. Great, thank you so much to all of the speakers today and Dr. Karen for helping us to moderate. Um, it was wonderful and inspiring to hear how people have put these different programs into place and it's, um, it's clearly a much needed area, both um, uh, overall in the general population, but also in our patients with um, chronic diseases. So I'm really excited to have everyone come today and the participation on the part of, of the group too. So with that, um, we, want, we are gonna have you complete a survey just to get an evaluation of it today. You'll see that in the survey link. And then also just to learn more about uh, cardio.org, you can uh, go to our website and you can email us there if you have some additional questions. I know we put it in the chat at info at cardio.org. Um, so thank you everyone for joining with us today.